Everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us again in another meeting of uh, Team New Tech. Um, I think everyone's familiar with the format. We will have our keynote speaker who will speak for 15, 20 minutes, five minutes of Q&A. This evening we have four entrepreneurs who will speak. They will each get five minutes. And my third time alarm clock will go off. So you need to stop when it goes off. Now have five minutes of Q&A, and then we'll stop again and switch to the next person. So before we get started, I want to thank all the sponsors that make our evening possible. Uh, Schedule for reminding you, rescheduling you, and filling cancellations. Atomic Object, designing and building world-class software products. The Mid-Michigan Innovation Center, collaborate, educate, and succeed. Uh, Star Garden, out in Grand Rapids, helping people start to get started. Uh, wisdom, family companies, and Quicken Loans. Uh, most especially want to thank our host this evening, Grand Circus, and Katie showed us. Okay, why don't you come on over, tell us a little bit about what it is that you guys do, how long you've been here, and how long you've been with business. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, I especially appreciate that the entrepreneurs have a five-minute timer on them. I know how entrepreneurs like to talk. Um, <laughs> and I'll include myself in that category, so I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, so Grand Circus, this lovely building that you are all sitting in, has actually only been around for less than two months. We are very much a part of ourselves. And where this came from was this vast need in Detroit for programmers, for technical. There are 1,100 job openings in Detroit on any given day for people who can program. That's astounding, especially given the unemployment right here. So we were founded to try and bridge that gap because there's so much going on with the tech startup scene, right? You have Detroit Venture Partners next door, you have Accelerate Michigan going on in two weeks, you have the best Detroit, you have Level of Ventures. So there's a number of financial sources going in, and all these entrepreneurs have great ideas, and then no tech people around to make these ideas products. So that is the gap we were trying to fill. Uh, another gap we're trying to fill here is, <laughs> in the words of one of my cynical friends who works in the tech industry, she said, there are so few programmers in Detroit that people who can write just like a little bit of HTML think that they're the best thing since 96. Uh, we could be better. There, are, I'm sure that applies to no one in this room, but I'm sure also that every programmer, every coder, every tech person can learn a little more. So we're not just teaching the basics, we're also trying to take you who are the mid-level and make you advanced. So if any of you are stoked to learn a really exciting advanced skill or your company wants to send you to come learn one, send an email our way and we'll try and make that class happen specifically. But it's not just classes, right? It's also support for the entrepreneurs. Uh, where do they get their work done outside of the 1515 Broadway or another coffee shop in the area? Uh, it's hard to get things done when you're overhearing people like me on their cell phones talking to their friends back in Seattle. Uh, so that's why we have a polling space downstairs. It's beautiful floor to ceiling windows. It's a great community vibe. Today we celebrated. Thane is in the room. Thane launched his company last night. If we could just do like a round of applause. <laughs> so it's our first coworker launch. Uh, and I'm proud to say along the way, Thane hired one of our other coworkers to do videography. He's been working with um, another company called Ezest for some advice on coworking and launching his company, etc. So we do try to get community space. And of course, the number one thing we are is a community center. Uh, so we welcome in events like this. There are so many people in this room. This is so exciting. And this really speaks to the energy in this building in Detroit. And it's not going to keep building unless we give you guys a place to have these events, unless we encourage you to come back for more and keep learning and keep growing. And that's what Grand Service is all about. So uh, we've got some flyers out here. Maybe I'll just pass them around the room. Please come back for more events. And because you are such a special crowd to us, we actually have a great offer to make you. Uh, who here has heard of Startup Weekend? Startup Weekend is this really cool weekend where you start a company in a weekend. Uh, you get here on Friday, everybody pitches their ideas. They form little groups of two to 10 around the best ideas. And then they have until Sunday afternoon to figure it out, make a minimum viable product, and pitch it. The winner this year gets a month of coworking space in Grand Circus, as well as a bunch of other really cool stuff. And if you sign up for our Ruby programming class this weekend, if any of you are familiar with Ruby, uh, we'll throw in a free start weekend registration. So it's a pretty good deal because that's $125. And it's a great deal because our Ruby programming class is a cool language that's useful to learn. So please come back for more. Welcome to Grand Circus and have a great night. Are there any questions?
questions that people want to ask to learn more before Ken goes out. Yes? Yeah. Uh, two quick, uh, one question. Uh, how much does it cost to say run a desk or run a queue? That's a great question. Um, so right now our desks start at $400 a month, but we're trying to get an option of maybe doing $100 a month to have a non-dedicated desk on our third floor. Uh, we're also willing to work with entrepreneurs if you can truly prove that you have the need. So send us an email and we'll work something out on that. But it comes with Wi-Fi, printer, scanner, a really cool conference space that people actually want to be you as opposed to being like, oh my gosh, we have to go to a coffee shop again, as well as a wealth of opportunities to collaborate with other coworkers. Really and then also, um, who is behind, how did transcripts come to be with the BBG scandal? Who are the people that come in? So we're funded in part by Detroit Venture Partners, also Invest Detroit. Um, so we're backed by Dan Gilbert, is what we like to say. But this was a, a bunch of people in the Detroit area coming together and saying, this is a tree that the community has and trying to make it happen. You offer to like, businesses to outside of Detroit, so my company works at Northville, Michigan. Can we come down and you know, have some space here that we could rent out for some of the employees at that office if they want to work in Detroit? Yeah, actually we have a couple of companies in our space, uh, notably two Global and Tumblr, but that's under wraps because Melissa Mayer can't find out. Uh, but if there is an outposting of a small group of people who want to work in our space, uh, we can make that happen. Uh, we do try to keep it really focused on entrepreneurship but we're open to other people being there if they're willing to add to that collaborative community and have something to give. We also have a pay-for-visit system that you're not going to be here the whole month, just a couple times a month for a visit. Yeah, Ruby class, so Ruby class is people. This weekend? Is that the old student, is that a beginner class? Uh, the Ruby class, that right here, my mom, is a 101, isn't it? It's a beginner Ruby class. The Ruby class? Yeah. Yeah, it's worked as a girl for the 101. So it's some existing programming experience, but new to repeat. Now the other question I have is, what level of people are you taking in to train? I know that we had a couple of entrepreneurs that pitched in our sessions. So we can take X automotive assembly plant work. And we can get them started in the training. Is that the level you're talking about? Or are you talking about people that have a bit more background and experience in the program? So who is your ideal type of person to come in to learn from your operation? That's a great question too. So as I said, we're a startup, right? So you getting involved in Grand Circus and emailing us what you want can be part of shaping Grand Circus for the future. A lot of our classes this semester have been very much beginner classes. Uh, our Build a Dynamic Website class, which again you can ask Faye about if you have questions, took people from the most basic to HTML, I know nothing, and by the end of 10 weeks they will know how to develop a website. However, we would like to move into more advanced courses after the semester, and we're also willing to do it on a company company basis. So if your company wants to train five workers in a specific skill, that's something that we can work on as well. So. We're actually designing next semester's courses right now, or scheduling them. So if you have input, if there's stuff you want to learn, let us know. We'll try to make it happen. Any other questions? And also, I should mention that classes aren't just on tech. We also have classes with, like, this weekend we have one on print and digital design. So if you're a painter, if you're an artist, how to turn that skill into graphic design. Uh, we also have classes on entrepreneurship. We had a really good one on sales, sales, sales. We have one coming up on uh, the things they don't teach you about a startup, including accounting, finances, and other boring stuff. Uh, and for how to write a business plan is coming up, et cetera. So if you're in the tech or entrepreneurship or art or really small business or almost anything, we probably have something to hopefully teach you. Uh, I should mention on the Startup Weekend offer, if you do sign up for the Ruby programming class, shoot me an email and tell me that you were here and got that offer, and then I will make sure you get the free registration. And your email address is? Kate at grandcircus.co or right here, hello at grandcircus.co. They gave you the hello email because I'm friendly. So, <laughs> shoot me an email about anything and come back soon. Great, thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Great. our keynote speaker for this evening, Mark Hooper. Uh, Mark has a background in public accounting, 
son of Ernst Young. He's now a founder of Andrews Cooper and Public. They have offices in Pocomo, Super Rapids, Saginaw, Bay City, Midlands, and Auburn Hills. He has leadership service background uh, as president of the Capital City Community Foundation, two Lansing Area Rotary Clubs, MSU College of Business Alumni Board, and two MSU Department of Advisory Boards. Uh, a note for our presentation tonight, he's a founding member of Capital Community Angels, and deeply involved in investment screening, due diligence, membership development, and community outreach. So Mark, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here with you tonight. Uh, you know, Capital Community Angels is very much a startup in our own right. And I'd like to uh, tell you about our story. As uh, was just said, a little bit about my background. Uh, I think I was destined to participate in the angel market because my training in that was public accounting. CPAs are trained to be skeptical <laughs> at everything that we, we look at. And that's kind of a natural element to be involved in, in this kind of field. Um, I spent uh, 17 years with Ernst & Young as partner there in the Lansing office, and then in 1993 I had the opportunity to join with other partners and acquire the private company practices in Lansing and Saginaw, and that's how our, our firm got started. Uh, spent 20 years doing that. Uh, since 1999 I've been a, on the board of directors of the Auto Owners Insurance Group, which is a, a Fortune 500 mutual insurance company here based in, in uh, Michigan. Uh, in 2007, the Capital Community Angels was formed, and, and to be honest, I think the initial thrust of that group was uh, in part philanthropic. We looked at the business environment in the uh, central Michigan area and said it needs something to assist in the startup world. Perhaps we can play a role of providing uh, startup capital for that community. As as time evolved, I think we became more and more convinced that if we operated as a traditional angel group and provided those types of services, feedback, participation, that would be the most valuable thing that we could do in providing that insight and feedback and, and grading uh, with respect to the opportunities as to our belief as to its likelihood of success. So we, we formed in 2007. Our geographic focus is 90 miles from Lansing. It's, it's really designed to say that we're going to participate with the company and observe them and be uh, associated with them on a frequent basis. We want to be able to drive there and participate in board meetings, committee meetings, uh, annual meetings, and, and those types of things. We operate on what we call a shared effort model. Uh, you know, when we think of angels, we think of here's the individual angel that is the lone wolf angel making that investment decision, the evaluation, the due diligence all on their own. Or the alternative that we think of an angel fund where there might be a pooling of the financial resources into the fund and it's more professionally managed and a small group is doing the investigation, the, uh, the attractment of the investment opportunity, the evaluation of the opportunity, and, and the administrative work associated with it. In our model, uh, individuals pay a basic membership dues for carrying on our uh, basic needs of meeting space, administrative duties, and those types of tasks. But beyond that, uh, all of the efforts are volunteer driven. <laughs> So the efforts of uh, recruiting potential investment opportunities, recruiting members, uh, doing due diligence on a particular deal, all of that is shared by our, our individual members. We, uh, we equate it to like a Rotary Club example. Um, most, like most angels, um, uh, virtually every one of our members has had uh, entrepreneurial experience in their background and that's what's caused them to have an interest in this field as part of their investment portfolio but also as part of their giving back. Um, as a startup, uh, we have a focus on saying uh, from an enterprise, the entity needs to have at least 100 grand of uh, capital investment needs for us to want to pursue it, it just doesn't make sense sense that needs below that, that's really the friends and family around and we don't want to try to get into that, that level of setting. You know, I think the statistics show that a typical angel around nationwide still averages for an angel group investment somewhere in the $250,000, $300,000 area with a total round maybe being a million to a million and a half for initial first round. Uh, 
our experience has been our group uh, has provided up to the 300,000 or so area as in our investment and then we've syndicated or participated with other angel groups that the round or raise is needed to be uh, much higher than that. Obviously it's a high risk area. So to participate in this area we're looking for companies that have high revenue growth potential. Many of the deals that we looked at have been pre-revenue. So from our process standpoint, one of the first things we do is screen for the opportunity to make a pitch. We want to uh, normally try to make sure that we're looking at all enterprises consistently, so we ask the group to prepare a two-page application form, complete that. That allows us to assess it for the various factors that we typically look at. We often then supplement that with a phone screen and call to references on other people that might have had exposure to the entity. First step is look for the uniqueness of the offering. Is it, is it What's the product like? What's the service or system being proposed? We ask the basic question of how uh, compelling with the benefits that they have that the offering to their targeted customers. We look at the factors of sustainability. Um, what is the strategy for establishing and maintaining a competitive advantage? Do they have the ability through patent protections or uh, secrets, uh, company secrets or processes to be able to protect this. Um, we also look for uh, the opportunities if, if the product or service is targeted initially at an initial market, does that same setting have application to other areas? Um, often, and we've seen this right off the bat, where some of our companies have, have uh, started off with their ideas and their market focus and focuses on a particular product area and as they uh, launched they've discovered that there's roadblocks, increased costs and things like that that might not uh, allow that to be as attractive as they initially thought. So they'll spin to another area where it has the same abilities from a competitive advantage and uh, utility to be able to spin to that area. Um, and then pursue that route from a development and launch perspective. We also look at that really from an assessment of the long-term potential of the enterprise and its market potential. Um, associated with SPIN, we want to know what they've done to really understand the market in the very first place and what, is, what do we think their ability is going to be to attract and address that's that market. We look at the strategies as uh, of uh, being very, very critical, um, try to assess those strategies as to how effective they're likely to be, whether or not they've done the homework and due diligence on trying to select that strategy and how they plan to implement it. Uh, we look at competition. What is the current competition? Uh, you know, one of the classic things is when they say, well, I, you know, I really don't have competition because this is unique. We discount that immediately because we always know there's competition. One of the competitions is doing nothing, continuing on with the, with the way it is. But we know really how have they assess the competition and um, the cost of, it, of looking at uh, maintaining that competitive position and the cost of attracting marketplaces. Um, very important is the scaling up process. Um, do they understand what it's going to take to go from pre-revenue, launch, customer development, product development, uh, in all the aspects of creating that business. Um, part, of, part of this process is looking at the, the cost of product development, but also the cost of infrastructure needs and what likely financing needs might be needed down the road. Um, you know, Patty is a person in the room, I'm going to point her out, that we've had frequent conversations with along the way of in just saying as, as this entity grows, uh, what does a typical venture capital firm look like if additional financing is needed to really advance this company? And what kind of requirements might they have uh, in terms of looking at you know, the consistency of the business, the clarity of the business, the administrative structure, how does this company operate in a way to avoid the warts and problems that may preclude them to be able to attract uh, end financing. 
Um, I, I put leadership on the last slide, but really the team strength. I, th I think uh, we've really gravitated towards trying to go as in-depth into looking at the key strengths of the people that are involved in the enterprise. How, how well do they know the product, understand the industry, what are their personal strengths and attributes, will they have the ability to stand behind it, how committed are they to the enterprise, uh, you know, is this something that uh, since many of us grew up as entrepreneurs, um, do they live, breathe, and think about the success and how is this uh, ingrained in their blood of wanting the, the success, this business opportunity to be successful. You know, as investors, we look at it and say, uh, from our perspective, we're highly interested in the success of the business, but we're never going to be more interested than the entrepreneur themselves. So that's, that's kind of a benchmark question that we have, try to ask. Um, we hope that the, the entrepreneur has a very positive attitude and sense of commitment that it is going to be a worthwhile to put the effort behind this enterprise and to launch it and to expend their, their personal capital of time and resources and the commitments that they make to their team members and to their families about wanting this business to be successful. Um, but we also hope that it's realistic. I, I told you right at the beginning that that I'm a CPA, so my natural reaction is to be a, a skeptic. And so people that interact with us will um, hopefully benefit from the test of the questions that we'll ask and, and they're really helping them feel confident after going through the, the process that they thought of the things that are going to be major, major influences on their success group. So we want uh, to have asked all questions, but we also want to know that the enterprise itself has a sense of realism. Our approach is, uh, unlike tonight where you got five minutes, our approach is to allow you 15. And then after the 15 minutes, uh, to spend uh, 15 minutes in the question and answer time period. You know, the reality is sometimes we go beyond that, um, but our, our real objective is to, at the end of that time frame to say, no, well, we, we really don't have an interest. <laughs> That, I think, is a benefit to all to say if there's something that truly doesn't match or if we see problems uh, that you get that information communicated to you very, very early on in the process. Often, however, we say we, we really like you, we really like the business and the opportunity, but from a staging standpoint, you aren't far along far enough along in the development curve on all the aspects of it, whether or not it's to the assembly of the team, whether it's the development of the product idea, whether it's selection of the marketing uh, process, or any of the things in arranging your uh, structure of allowing this to move forward. If it's a success in our process, we will have conducted that 15-minute uh, exchange of questions and answers, and then from our work model, it, uh, we excuse the, uh, the entrepreneurial team, and then we talk about it as a group. We do our own evaluation, we do our own assessment, and at the end of the day, we do it around the table. Are, are you interested? As I described in the initial slide, as a volunteer-driven organization, the key filter is if there's people that are willing to participate in the due diligence process, that means we're interested and we'll move forward with that investment. So we're, we're saying to the entrepreneur at that time, we have a very strong interest, we're, we're willing to uh, contribute personal time to, to this uh, investment opportunity. Uh, our focus on, uh, from an investment uh, opportunity is first, we concentrate on the technical aspects of what we're proposing. So we'll do an assessment of uh, what do we think the uh, software might do or the product might do. We have the benefit of being old, old people. Uh, and being old, we've been able to accumulate a lots of contacts throughout that, that time period. So we use the benefit of those relationships to help us do an assessment of this and through those assessments really get to an understanding of, of uh, is, is the technical performance going to be what it should be and have we asked the right questions. Um, after we've done the technical analysis, then we tend to dive into the other areas of the marketing plans, the financing plans, the assessment of the team, and the leadership requirements, 
uh, looking at the various marketing uh, opportunities that might be present, present um, whether or not there's other angel groups that we might need to uh, associate with and bring them on the deal and, uh, and get their assessment at the same time that we're doing it. So that if the uh, need is beyond our fundraising setting, that we be that we will be convinced that there might be the ability to raise the overall funds to properly launch this enterprise. And once that's done, then we'll go to uh, the legal due diligence and a term sheet uh, negotiations. Uh, I was asked the question earlier tonight: What industry focus do we have? Well, you know, as an angel group. Um, I think angels tend to be more broad in their focus than the venture group, where the venture really has more often a more industry focus and skill set. Um, our current portfolio, the investments that we've made, uh, indicated kind of a broad <coughs> the, the very first one that we did was a material uh, material company and material supply company, which uh, develops carbon graphenes. Uh, using nanotechnology, uh, very, very uh, high risk, high opportunity, but high potential return if this entity is, is successful. Uh, another one was Boral Farm. Boral, Boral Farm uh, uses boron-based chemical building blocks as catalysts to assist the pharmaceutical industries and other, other uh, chemical processors in being more effective in the way that they're uh, plant operations operating, including from the research all the way to the production settings. Accio uh, is a wind power company where they're developing an alternative way to generate using wind uh, as a setting to using no moving parts to generate increased energy sources. Um, by way of example and illustrating the 90 mile setting, XG Science is, is a Lansing area company. Uh, Boral Farm has uh, their headquarters down in Ann Arbor. Accio has their headquarters in, Accio, in uh, Ann Arbor. Uh, Vesteron is uh, developing spider venom insecticides, spider-based venom insecticides are targeted towards the agricultural nuts and fruit uh, marketplaces. Their headquarters are in the Kalamazoo, Southwest Michigan area. Are You Human is a software company just right down the street. Many of you probably are familiar with that one. Um, Biophotonic Solutions is, uses uh, tools to enhance the performance of FEMTA-based lasers. That's a uh, Lansing area uh, company. And then Avagant is a head-mounted display uh, company uh, based out of the southeast area. <coughs> of uh, Michigan. Uh, we're working on a term sheet to close our next investment that should close in January, and that one is going to be in the medical space. So you can see just based on each one of these that it's uh, fairly broad in terms of the industry focus. Uh, from a personal standpoint, I, I've enjoyed this, uh, just taking the 37 years of professional career experience and the knowledge base generated during that time period and being able to apply it to the angel investment setting and help the entrepreneurial companies really get an assessment on uh, their companies as they presented them, but also to be able to sit around the room and uh, interact with the other angel investors and participate in the process where I'm fortunate that many of the other members in our group have uh, doctor's degrees and, and uh, clean water and uppers uh, and experience in software and tech firms and experience in the medical field and experience with engineering and other topics. So we have some very bright people in the room and it's, for me it's been uh, kind of generative again of, of uh, just learning. It's caused me to, to subscribe to science magazines and things like that and go back to, to school to learn more about the terms that are sometimes used. Uh, if you want to know more about us as a group, uh, you can go to our website. It's uh, ccangels.org uh, or Google Capital Community Angels. And thus far, they're, we're the only people that I know that are using that name here in Michigan. Hopefully, that will give you some background about how, uh, where we stand as a really a fledgling angel group getting started. 
Uh, we had the experience of 2007 of really hitting the ground fast, having the, the 2008 recession kind of cause us to all take a look and say what's going on. And the deal flow really slowed down at that time and we really effectively relaunched in the uh, end of 2010 and primarily in 2011 in sense. Any questions? Well, first of all, thank you very much. Before we start the <laughs> Do we have a question over here? Yes. Just wondering if you would share um, what's the total investments as a group we've made thus far in all those companies and the typical deal that you do. Is it convertible debt? Is it uh, equity investments? And if it's equity, what kind of range of valuations do you look at? Uh, so the, the range, first, in terms of total dollars, I don't know it off the top. It's about a million and a half. You know, if we looked at it from an uh, average deal from our group in the 200 to 300 range and six or seven deals. Someone else in that category. Um, first couple based on the stage of the companies and from the type of investments, it's primarily been two, two types. First type being a convertible debt. Second type being a preferred convertible preferred. And uh, Really, the driver on both of those has been the stage of the company. So we're in the, it's been a very early stage. It's very difficult to derive value. It looked like the, the time in which a, another Series A fin financing might occur is close. Uh, we've tended to go to the convertible debt route and going at a discount of that conversion rate. Then again, depending on the nature of the company, there might be a cap where we say in order to be compensated for the stage of the company, that the conversion rate won't occur above this, this type of cap. Um, you know, part of the thing we look at is saying we don't want to have a terms that are so difficult that it makes it difficult for that next financing round to actually occur. That's part of the investment strategy we also look at is uh, you know, a couple of uh, principles of uh, Unity of leadership, is there clear leadership in, uh, within the company so that we know unity of command is present within the company and also the common interest that might exist with the investment community. Um, is it likely that all the participants in this in investment are going to have the same mindset and desire as to the growth path of the company, the financing needs to support that, and the exit strategy that might be present? Um, or your second part of your question? Yeah, I was just uh, the other part was if you do an equity, what kind of valuation range are you finding in the early stage? Uh, it's it's going to be what you read in the in the marketplace uh, the averages. And if you read in the marketplace on the averages, those have tended to be for angel values, a million and a half to two and a half million. Part of that is just the basic driver on looking at the timing and when the exit strategy might occur, what well, likely dilution might occur prior to that time, and the possible multiple. And the realization that the you know, exits, when you get uh, upon a, a sale of the company that's above a $20 million price, that's pretty, it gets tougher. So the, the likely efforts and to get the multiples and the return ratios that we know we need to have in order to make this uh, reasonable. It's got to start in those kind of levels. On an overall basis, to answer your other question you didn't ask, we seek, uh, when we look at an individual investment, we ask ourselves, is it likely that this individual investment can produce a 35% internal rate of return? If it can, then we'll pursue it. Because we know that the likelihood of all our investments being a success is not likely. Although, every one of the investments that we made today is still alive. <laughs> what is uh, your response and or the reaction of your angel network to the uh, on the band of general solicitation, how that affects um, equity placements and requirements on angels and companies trying to raise money directly from 
funding or if they're any funding using uh, general solicitation? Well, um, many of our members in our group will not get involved in any type of setting where their social security number has to be provided. So the thought of saying uh, we're going to turn over a tax return uh, as an example of proof of uh, net worth and income uh, capacity just says we, we aren't going to participate in those markets. Um, so from our perspective, we're looking at it fairly conservatively and saying that we're going to seek opportunities that fall, we believe, under the restriction where they haven't done any general solicitation yet, they will fall under the uh, the old uh, regulations, which means they uh, we can just attest that we are qualified investors. Great, great, Mark. Thank you very much. Mark, will you be able to hang around for our four speakers so yeah. people can ask some questions? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, Scott Phillips will be our first entrepreneur out while he's getting his computer set up. Um, Scott grew up with a, a whole vaulting pit in his backyard. Most of his neighbors had basketball courts, volleyball nets, and swing sets. Not Scott and his brothers. They were uh, always pole vaulting over people, cars, houses. They, they had fun, they had fun. Uh, Scott, kind of similar to Marx, but most of his time in corporate America, including 15 years of World Bowl, he told me while he was sitting in client meetings over the last year, doing innovation consulting with tiny, fast-moving companies like Exxon Mobil, he said, you know, I'm missing something here. Decided he wanted to work with true startups and entrepreneurs instead. So he is here with us, and Scott, take it away. Hi, thank you. Thank you. So again, my name is Scott Phillips, and I'm founder of The Searchlight, and I have a couple of my colleagues with me here, uh, Ramra Tirupati and Mark Johnson, and um, i happy to be here tonight. So when we decided, or I decided to do a startup, I kept seeing this infographic that you're seeing on the screen here, and I'm sure you've seen something like it, or some information like it, about the success rate of startups. And I, I don't know if the numbers are exact, but some of the fact that 10% of all new products started up uh, succeed, the rest fail. And as far as the entrepreneurs themselves, 18% uh, of first-time entrepreneurs succeed. I've heard numbers ranging from 10 to 18. So I saw this the first question. I said, well, what am I doing? Why do I get into this business? But really what I asked was, why is this happening? Um, why is the success rate of uh, startups uh, so poor? And so um, I think we've all read the information. Sometimes it's the technology. Sometimes it could be the team, like Mark was speaking about. Uh, sometimes it can be early stage funding, but uh, a lot of what I was reading was it had to do with the market, understanding of their customer, and uh, what I would call customer discovery, uh, kind of using lean startup language. And so that's what I started doing was my own customer discovery about what was going on with other startups doing their customer discovery. So the Searchlight is an online, challenge-based uh, customer discovery engine that provides startups with potential customer segments that they should be talking to. Um, it's a front-end tool for the lean startup and customer discovery process, if you've read about that or are familiar with kind of that movement, Steve Blank and Lean Startup. Um, this is a graphic that I stole shamelessly out of Steve Blank's uh, information. Um, it's, it, so his concept is that a lean startup goes through four phases, customer discovery, customer development, uh, customer, uh, customer creation, and in business formation. And that you just don't really worry about uh, those later stages until you really deeply understand the problems you're trying to solve and the, the solution you have, uh, you validate that it solves those problems. So uh, the Searchlight participates in the very front end of the Lean Startup process. So the first stage is customer discovery, and there's four phases to that. The first phase is called hypothesis development. And this gets into what's called the business model canvas, where you make a bunch of guesses or hypotheses about how your business model is going to work. And one of the important things you're doing very early on is hypothesizing about who your customer segment is, who has issues that your technology and your solution can solve. And that's where we play. We play right there to try to provide better information when you get started on your customer validation. Again, this is the business model canvas that you'll see used at a lot of business accelerators or university tech transfer programs, uh, made by Alex Osterwalder, uh, becoming more ingrained. And it kind of fits like a glove with the lean startup process. So 
The process teaches you how to do it, and the business model canvas is kind of your scorecard as you're going through making hypotheses about how your startup is going to work. And one of the, the early segments, was, there's nine boxes in it, one of the early, uh, the, the most important ones early on is that customer segment and your value proposition, and making sure that you have found what's called a product market fit or a problem solution fit. That you really have something that's going to solve problems and you know who those customers are that you're going to solve them for. So again, the searchlight is an accelerator, an engine tool that you can use to kind of discover some, we'll call it application-rich domain areas that you should be investigating first. Uh, as you're kind of looking for who your beachhead market is. Um, it's software as a service. Uh, it runs as a one-week challenge. So essentially what happens is an inventor or an entrepreneur posts their, their value proposition or their solution. We kind of simplify it, decompose it a little bit. Uh, we've got a process that goes through four phases over the course of a one-week challenge. We engage a user community that involves the inventor themselves, innovators creating customer profiles, investors who are kind of giving, you might think, a shark tank type feedback, and then the wisdom of the crowd, influencers who are getting on and looking at them and voting and so forth. And so that's, uh, that's kind of the way the tool works. In the end, the final output is what we call a value proposition canvas. So again, what we've done is taken sometimes what is a, a very scientific solution, broken it down very simply into what it can do, what it can gain and creates, and then we, we challenge the crowd to come up with customer segment profiles that have a nice product fit, and uh, it's kind of a fun game the way you engage. So you find out is that problem a shark bite, a dog bite, or a mosquito bite? And we ask the crowd to kind of say how big a problem is it? And then we want to find out if that's a good fit, a good fit for this value proposition, a poor fit, or somewhere in between. So we're really trying to understand from the wisdom of the crowds, are you solving a shark bite? And do you have a good fit with your technology or value proposition? And so that's it. Where we're at is we're doing our own customer discovery. We're starting to go to some industry shows. Uh, we're launching our first proof of concept with some professors of the Michigan State of Spartan Innovations. And uh, we're thinking about what the next gen of software platform is, and we need software development help badly. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Any questions? Great. Questions? Canvas tools out there, Lean Launchpad and Lean Launch Lab and Australia has strategizers. So there are people using a lot of canvases to track their hypothesis and their testing. I'm not a canvas tool at all. I'm really a knowledge research engine. So we're certainly complementary, but what we're going to do is feed you ideas about what those hypotheses should be that you're entering into the canvas tools. You, uh, well, we'll go Sorry, I have a question. Um, so, um, what we just heard about, one part of the um, software is that you can get the addressable market. Have you considered that already? You, well, you're market? Yeah, my own market. Yeah, so far, so we've done 40 customer discovery interviews, and we're going to do 100, which is kind of the benchmark. And we've pivoted several times. We started out looking at second stage growth companies. We thought that they and their investors would be looking for adjacent markets. and. Turns out that's not the case. They're focused on their primary business. We talked to VCs and angel investors about their portfolios and help they needed to have their portfolio companies grow. We pivoted away from that. Then we talked to startups themselves, and they really liked us, but they had no money. So <laughs> then we started talking to accelerators, public and private accelerators like Spark and the Smartphones and Y Combinator Private. They do like this. Uh, the, the, the beachhead market right now seems to be university projects and um, university tech transfer offices. So they have a lot of, you know, U of M as an example, does a billion four of research. They have 420 disclosures a year, and they have a staff that's trying to figure out which of those they should move forward into commercialization. So right now, our, our two biggest opportunities are business accelerators and university tech transfer offices. We should talk after our market is welcome, IRS. Okay, great. marathon this year. So obviously he's a real content ticket. Uh, his company Centilla, Cent Sentinel, I'm sorry.
the Reed from Michigan and one from Indiana, so someone's not here. Yes, yeah, so okay. Um, just recently, April, May 2013, they were really committed to the job. They each worked for like two months, then they quit. And they signed there was nothing they'd rather do when they get this company up and running. Um, they thought about this idea in college after seeing some of their friends and themselves struggle with the issue that they're going to talk about. So they launched their alpha product in November of their senior year at school. And they're going to talk about it. Oh yeah, you gotta just give an input because they went from EGA to two months, then they quit. And they signed there was nothing they'd rather do than get this company up and running. Um, they thought about this idea in college after seeing some of their friends and themselves struggle with the issue that they're going to talk about. So they launched their alpha product in November of their senior year at school. And they're going to talk about it. Oh yeah, you gotta just give an input because they went from PGA to Evan, this is Tim, and this is Alex, and we have one other member, and together we are Cripspat. So freshman year of college, I got in, and everything was over my head. I was trying to find my way around, trying to find the friends to hang out with, trying to go to frat parties, you name it. And literally, the second week of college, my friend calls me up and says, hey Evan, have you found a place to live yet? And I was like, a place to live? For now? And they're like, no, for next year. I was like, I haven't even thought about that. I'm just trying to find where my math class is. <laughs> but in all seriousness, this is a big problem, at least at Michigan and at other campuses we've been finding out. Um, the students want to know where to live. They want all the data. They want all the information to find out to make the best choices. And there's tons of other websites out there that try to do this, like Craigslist, like that, and it's all content. They just throw content at you, so much content. We're trying to deliver on context. So we're trying to take things like videos, like reviews, neighborhoods, to give them the perfect decision so that they can go to the house that they want and be like, know that this is the place they want to live. So here's our... So this is what is currently up there. This is Cribspot. So we're a college website, and we aggregate all the listings in Ann Arbor, Bloomington, Indiana, which is for the University of Indiana, Madison, Wisconsin, for the University of Wisconsin, and unfortunately, East Lansing. <laughs> um, uh, it was a rough game. <laughs> Uh, so as you can see, we give the student tons of options here. They can filter based on uh, beds, budget, pretty much any criteria, search the area, find the perfect place for them. Through this, they can contact to message about whether it's available. You can see whether it's available. You can schedule a tour right through here. Um, we just really take that load and all the problems with trying to contact all these people individually out of the students' hands, making it simpler for them. Uh, so, did a great job explaining how this is great for students. 
On the other side, um, this added context, all this extra data, um, gives better leads for property managers. So that gives them students that already know everything about the neighborhood, about that house, before they even come into schedule a tour. Uh, we've talked with property managers that have to show a place 20 times before finally finding one student to sign a lease. And so we think we can really reduce that number. Uh, another unique aspect about uh, high demand college properties is that every year there's four, five, six, or more groups of students that want the same place. But what ends up happening is rather than giving it to this group of students that wants to pay the most, uh, they give it to the group of students who just kind of gets their act together first, scrapes together enough money for the security deposit, and that just doesn't make any sense with the modern economy. So uh, on the other side, uh, for the low demand properties, people still have trouble putting people into these low demand properties, or they have to invest a lot and take several months to finally find students for those low demand properties. Well, once we control the marketplace, we can control what students see, uh, what students see more, and we can really help to get those low demand properties filled. So, uh, at this point you're probably wondering how exactly we make money off of this, um, which is a good question. To make it, once we control the marketplace, um, there's a lot of options available to us. On the student side, we, we control not only a marketplace and listings, but also in sublets, in parking, in big cities, and with the listings. So we're controlling, we're taking commission, and we're controlling the marketplace on that side. On the property management side, as Tim mentioned, we are also, uh, we're, since we're providing these higher quality leads, there's a lot of opportunity with that. But the moral is that what we've learned um, is that when we control the marketplace, as we do at Michigan and as we're starting to do at other schools, there's a lot of potential on both sides. Yelp has showed this, that even a free model works once you create and you control the content. And because we have this proprietary content, um, so not only the listings, but as Evan touched on, the video tours, photos, uh, reviews of places, basically we're becoming the go-to place for students to search for their housing. And as we control the flow of students, we control what property managers, can, uh, what the, the property managers that are trying to access those students. So there's a lot of revenue opportunities there. So as this kind of summarizes, one, we're a listing service. We're providing the most listings of any place on these college campuses. Truly, uh, Zillow, they're not focused on college campuses, and there's really not a good option. So we're the number one place for listings. We have the most content. We have the most context. We have the neighborhoods, we have the reviews, we're providing context for these listings, and then we're providing the easy to use. So thank you, that's us, and we're Chris Spock. Any questions? Yeah. It sounds like you're basically uh, uh, an e-real estate broker specializing in college students. Yeah, in a sense, I guess uh, you could call us that. We're, we're not replacing a broker because there isn't really a, a place for brokers in the college market, but in a sense, we are that. We're giving students the full information so that they can make their own educated decision on where to go. So there's no need for a broker. We are, I guess you could call us an online broker in that sense. Um, so yeah, we're, we're providing that information. And in the long term, there's an endless amount of possibilities once we have that spot, which we're starting to establish, and once we're realizing that it exists. Um, and I mean, even beyond college campuses, like uh, expanding to Detroit, we're working with Quicken Loans, we're in FISDEM currently. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of potential in that, and it's really the the system the current system is really archaic in the sense that they're providing a tiny amount of information for a lot of places, and that's not really what you're using to make a decision when you're looking for a house. You want to know where your friends are living. You want to know about the neighborhood that you're living in. You don't want to know the the year that the house was built, and you don't want just a photo of the outside of the house. And so we're becoming that spot to go to for real information on how people look. So that end, uh, are you guys uh, considering integrating it with social media so that that you can, you know, get your own custom feed that says, yeah, you know, Jim or Jack or Amy or whoever is also yeah. right around this place? That's really what you're on the head. Okay. People really want to know where their friends are going to live, and we found that people want to know like what they're checking out, and we're working really hard to integrate features like a social feed so you can see literally what your friends are looking at on the side. Um, once they book a house, you can tell where they live. Um, we're thinking of some sort of collaboration where once you have these places, it can be easy to throw events, similar things like that. Um, so a bunch of ideas in the yeah. works. There's a, yeah. 
a lot of possibilities that really the market isn't playing to right now. Um, because like I mentioned, the market just really isn't geared towards what, how people are actually looking for housing. And we're providing a, a platform for people to look for housing, how they actually look for housing. And we're actually developing like a, a social component, similar to what you're saying like right now, and that should be out within a few weeks to a month, at least the first version. So it's sort of a way to figure out before you move in. You know, I know every time I've got a new place, I spend a few weeks afterwards trying to figure out, okay, what's around me? Yeah, Especially for college. yeah that's, right. that's actually another thing we're trying to incorporate is the local spots. So you can see, um, I know I want to be within 15 minutes walking of this bar, and for yeah. a student, I want to be within 10 minutes walking of the library, <laughs> most likely by its first the best. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you can actually, you can search based on what you're looking around with these spots that are around campus or close by. Um, and that's another thing that we're exploring and working on right now. Yeah, Mark? It sounds like some of your data needs to be, it can be stacked more long term. Yes, exactly. Some of the data you need to have for real value is real time. How do you control that real time? What's the cost of developing and maintaining real time data? Yeah. So the only, I guess, real time data per se would be availability. Um, sometimes prices. Price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, price. Um, Where your neighbor moved in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. so Oh, well, the price to, to address availability, we're working with property managers on these campuses. So uh, we're a free-to-list service, which is another way that we're really changing the market because we have all the listings because we're free-to-list. We don't just have 100 listings because you have to pay to list. Um, so we're working with these property managers. Property managers are updating availability. Every time they get a message about a lead, gives them the option to just mark as leased. So the, the information is like being updated rapidly all the time. In addition to that, we can also crowdsource that information from students. Uh, the idea is that no student should ever have to ask the same question or query for the same information at twice. So uh, you give a call, it will give you a button. This is not there yet, but we're working on this. Um, is it available? No, yes. And then uh, they'll mark it, it'll, it'll mark it as leased. The property manager will be able to confirm whether or not that was actually true. If they don't respond, we'll go with the student's decision. So a lot of these things, any kind of that real-time information can easily be crowdsourced by the students that are finding those things out, and then also with property managers too. Yeah. Any other questions? You, you had a question earlier. Uh, that was pretty much covered just now. Uh, yeah. okay. Great job, guys. Okay. I do have one yeah. quick question, personal question, really. Are, are you guys all doing this full time at this point? Yes, or we are. are. Good. Yeah, Congratulations. Yeah, <laughs> yeah two, uh, two business and uh, Tim and Evan are uh, uh, programmers. Not so much questions to make here, but if you go into the grad student market, so I just went to law school at Michigan, so when I was coming from New York and I had no desire to want to search for an apartment, and I would have paid $150 to just outsource that whole role and say, give me an apartment in the grad student area as a studio. Don't contact me about 18 listings. Like, find me two and like let's do this. And that's the same thing. Oh, sorry, no. No, 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 that's that's the same thing with international out. students right. as well. Yeah. So there's a lot of that's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. We definitely that's what we're discovering is as we provide this. Sorry to go over. Uh, yeah. As we're providing this context, it's narrowing. It's not like you have to live and look at 18 places because you can see this is where grad students from Michigan have lived in the past. This is where um, a lot of people my age are looking. Yeah. This is the place that meets my criteria, and it really narrows it down by like what you're looking at. Great. Thank you guys very much. That formally ends our evening. Um, upcoming announcements. Our next new tech will be on the uh, first Monday in December, so first Wednesday in December, December 4th. Tom will post on the website where we will be. Next week we have um, Accelerate Mission Innovation Competition. Are there any other announcements about upcoming events? Nobody? Okay, well that's it. I think everyone is still here, so please continue to talk with the, all the presenters, ask them some more questions. I look forward to seeing you at Accelerate Michigan next week or at the New Tech in the beginning of December. Thanks.